Good morning and welcome to our Palm Sunday ser sermon. We need the lessons for today. We can find those here. The first gospel is John 12, verses 12 through 19. The Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah, the 50th chapter, verses 4 through 9. The epistle is Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And our second gospel, it is the second gospel, it's an extension of the first, is John 12, verses 20 to 43. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from the Gospel lesson. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Dear friends of Christ Jesus our Lord, this is an important day in the church. It's when Christ comes into Jerusalem for the Passover for the last time. He's entering Jerusalem, the city of David, for that one last time of Passover with his disciples. And as he approaches Jerusalem, the people began to do many things, one of which they were throwing palm branches on the road in front of him. That was a symbol of victory, also a nationalistic symbol for Judah, but here it's also a symbol of Jesus' victory over sin. It is at hand now. There are others, some who are even spreading their coats on the road to honor him, and everyone is very excited. Many have come for the feast for Passover. And they're shouting things, things like, Hosanna! A Hebrew expression meaning, save me. Which became eventually an exclamation of praise. Also, they were crying out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Indeed, that's what Jesus had done. Blessed is a king of Israel. Jesus, the Christ, is the king who has come. Hallelujah! Hail to the son of David! These are the things that were going on. The city, well, it's excited and crowded and a hustling place during the Passover. But you have this adding to it. So many are seeing what is going on and wondering, is this the time when that promised Messiah is going to come and that we are going to be freed from bondage to the Romans or any other enemies that we have? There were those out there who truly believed that Jesus was the Christ. There was his disciples, not just the twelve, not just the seventy-two, but several hundred, who would follow him as much of the time as they could. And then there was another group, those who thought that Jesus might be the Christ. And that would comprise much of the crowd, because you have a large number of pilgrims there, and they don't know exactly what to expect, but because they haven't seen all the things that have gone on. And there were others there as well, who hold him to be a prophet. Basically, the first or second, depending how you want to look at things, in the last 400 years. John the Baptist had gone before him, but he was not the prophet Jesus is. Now, we have here a time that the people are expecting good things because of some of the rumors that went through and some of the information that was there. The people were intrigued because Jesus had fulfilled all the prophecies about the Christ. And he also is a descendant of King David. 
So he could be the Christ. He has fulfilled and done those things which were necessary, the things that came from God. And now Jesus is in the temple, and we see what happens now in this week. First of all, we have the Pharisees, and they're saying to one another, look how the whole world has gone after him. They were afraid for their position, a position of honor, pride, wealth. These things were in jeopardy if he was a king and the Romans came to put things down. So they were troubled when they said, look, the whole world has gone after him. Interestingly enough, there were also different groups there. Some Greeks wanted to see Jesus. Well, the Greeks weren't allowed to go anywhere but the outer court. The outer court was a court of the Gentiles. A court on the inside of that is a court of the women. The one inside that is a court of the men. And then there is one around the Holy of Holies. So these Greeks obviously couldn't go to Jesus because Jesus was most likely in the court of the men. So they sent Philip with a request to see if they could speak with him. So there were not just Jews that were being attracted, non-Jews as well. And the salvation that Jesus was preparing here was for everyone. John's point that he wants all of us to be very much aware of. The hour has come. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And there was glory in Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He was being honored as a king. He was being honored as the long prophet Messiah. He was being honored as a miracle worker and a great prophet. All these things the crowds saw and wondered. Obviously, the power of God was upon him. All you needed to know that was to look at the various miracles that Jesus had done. Not just one or two or whatever, but dozens and dozens. People with all kinds of diseases are cured simply by touching him. The deaf hear, the lame walk and in fact run, and the blind see. Even lepers are cured. And these are things the Old Testament had prophesied would be a mark of the Christ. And he even casts out demons. All of them seem to be subject to his authority. Jesus has even risen or raised the dead. Not once or twice, but three times. The three times indicating that it's the work of God. Here, the Son of God. That we have these resurrections. And the latest one was just a few days ago. Lazarus, who many people knew, well, he had died, and they put him in a tomb, and had been there for several days, and they could smell the decomposition, so they knew he was dead. And when that happened, there was a large crowd of people there. And Jesus simply called to him, to Lazarus, to come forth from the tomb. And he came out alive and well. There were so many witnesses to that. Then you had the religious leaders and those who were in their service. They weren't quite as fond of Jesus, if you will. Not at all. Some of them thought he was a problem. Others thought that Jesus was a threat and that he had to be disposed of. He was too dangerous to leave alone. Yet, at the same time, even among the leaders, there were those who believed in him, those who would come to him at night. But because of the Pharisees, 
they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. The Pharisees had promised that any who believed in him would be removed. So these people, these men, love praise from men more than praise from God. But here, in the triumphant entry, he is riding into a city on a young donkey. That doesn't seem think the way we would think it'd be. It'd be a large charger or a white one, but that's not the way it was supposed to be done. A young donkey was what a king was supposed to wear when he entered his capital for the first time. That was the way that King David had done it. So here we see him very much looking like a king. And that's how it was on that Palm Sunday. The king of the Jews, the Christ, indeed was coming into Jerusalem. The one that God had promised to send many times and many years before. But here God is being true to his promise to send his Christ to send to save the people. The people were looking for someone to save them from their enemies. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Just not the ones the people expected. Ones like the Romans were what they expected for him to be eliminating. But that was not who Jesus had been sent to save. Jesus was sent to save people from their worst enemies from Satan, from sin, and from eternal death. So the cries of Hosanna were certainly appropriate. Jesus is the one who saves. He came into Jerusalem as a messianic king, the eternal king of Israel, the eternal king of the entire world, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus simply didn't come to do what people expected. Rather, he came to do what the one God had sent him to do. He came as one who could save the people from their sins, all people, not just Jews. And he could only do that by going to the cross to be our substitute, to pay the price for our sin. The sins of all people, just as God had planned it. He came to save all people by his dying. Definitely something which is God's way of doing things, not the way that we would do it. And also, he then needed to be raised again eternally, just as all believers will. Again, God's way, not our way or man's way. It was a most amazing week. It started out on such a high note, the triumphant entry. There were amazing teachings going on throughout the week, in the temple and elsewhere. There was that wonderful satisfaction of eating the Passover in Jerusalem. And all of this was playing out just as God had intended. For the glory of God, for the glory of his Son, Jesus the Christ. Jesus had received one kind of glory as he entered into Jerusalem and he will receive a very different kind of glory as he leaves it on Friday. All of which occurs after one very dark day and one day was all it took. All of the passion of our Lord occurred in a day. 
Now, one of the things you note is that the gospel writers simply don't dwell on the suffering of Jesus. They report it somewhat briefly to show Jesus' obedience to the Father. But the principal theory or theme here is one of joy. Joy because our salvation has been accomplished by God. The triumphant king enters on Sunday and he leaves again the next Sunday. The battle has been fought. The victory has been won. Christ has triumphed over sin, death, and the grave. Hail to our eternal king. The bringer of our salvation has come. Now may that peace of God, which passes all human understanding, strengthen your faith in Christ Jesus until you see him in life eternal. Amen.